Time is of the essence when identifying and resolving issues in your software, and our friends at Raygun are here to help. Their brand new alerting feature is now available for crash reporting and real user monitoring, and they'll make sure you're quickly notified of the errors, crashes, and front-end performance issues that matter most to you and your business. You can set thresholds for your alert based on an increase in error count, a spike in load time, or new issues introduced in the latest deployment, along with custom filters that give you even greater control. You can assign multiple users to ensure the right team members are notified with alerts linked directly to the issue in Raygun that'll take you to the root cause faster. Never miss another mission-critical issue in your software again. Try Raygun alerting today and create a world-class issue resolution workflow that gives you and your customers peace of mind. Visit raygun.com to learn more. Their simple usage-based plans start from as little as $4 a month with unlimited apps and users. That's raygun.com, R-A-Y-G-U-N.com, to start your free 14-day trial. Hi, I'm Scott Hanselman. This is another episode of Hansel Minutes. Today I'm talking with UX designer Sharon Onyinye. She's an enthusiast with over four years experience. She does high quality user centric experiences. She's worked at a number of companies and has a really exciting YouTube. She's going to talk to me today about starting your first design project. How are you? I'm doing great. I'm so excited to talk to you today, Scott. Yeah, this is a space that I don't know a lot about. One of the things that I feel about design is that I know when it sucks, <laughs> but I can't make it good. And I find that really frustrating. And and since I'm a coder, this is a great time to kind of smash coding and design together and understand the differences between those two, uh, those two practices. How did you get started in design? Oh, so for me, I started out as a graphic designer and mostly self-taught. Personally, I have my own reservations about the concept of saying that you're self-taught because at the end of the day, you use resources online and someone is teaching you, just not in person or in the traditional sense, right? I learned essentially through resources online. And so I started out with this graphic branding focus, doing um, logos, flyers, all sorts of things um, for people. And it, it was kind of like this little side hustle that I was really interested in at a time. And then, you know, with time it grew. And after a while, I wanted to do more. I wanted to get into more technical things. I wanted to work on products. And I first of all got into front end development. So I did spend some time playing around with some HTML, some CSS, some React, a little bit of Angular and all of that. But it wasn't really, I still wanted to design. And so I had learned about user experience design and that just combined everything that I was really passionate about. So the design aspect, the technical aspect, working on products and the rest, as they say, uh, is history. It's interesting. So you don't have a formal degree in design, but you did uh, really hit on the fact that there's so many resources online. And I noticed by looking at your LinkedIn and exploring you online that you chose to get a ton of licenses and licenses, certifications, certificates, you know, all these little classes. You've kept track of all of those. Was that done for yourself or was that done to get jobs? Because you have over a dozen of different uh, things from like Coursera and the gymnasium and all the different places online that will give you like proof of, I did this. I think it's, it's a mix of everything. So of course there's the basis of wanting to gain as much knowledge as possible. Mm -hmm. And then also there's this feeling of, you know, you're competing with people, competing for jobs, uh, with people that have master's degrees in design related fields, people that did their bachelor's in design. And so you, kind of always feel like there you have to compensate for a lot of things, you know, and then you also know that people, you know, employers also tend to place value on these certificates um, from uh, schools. So for me, it was a way to get myself up to speed and which is something that I enjoy and also a way to kind of feel as if I can actually kind of compete <laughs> you know, and to prove support to employers that, yes, I actually do take, you know, learning and development seriously 
And yeah, so it's a mix of all sorts of things. You know, that's a really interesting way you phrased it. And I think that's worth digging into for a second here, because you're saying it was a way of saying I take learning and development seriously, because sometimes I feel like my degree didn't really teach me anything technically, but it taught me how to learn. And it's proof that I stuck with something for some period of time, even though a lot of the languages that I learned are dead. Yeah, absolutely. So I think just there's always going to be this weight, especially in the tech community. We always have these conversations about, do you need a degree? Do you not need a degree? We always have this back and forth. But for the foreseeable future, it always seems like um, these degrees are always going to carry some weight and people are still going to school uh, for them. And so I think once you, you realize that that might not be the route for you for whatever reason, then you have to get creative with how you're going to source your knowledge and how you're going to prove that you know this thing, this knowledge, you know. Mm, that is a very thoughtful way of putting it. I mean, the for, for me, I needed the degree because I wanted the structure because when I tried to put together a self-planned, you know, self-styled learning system of my own, I would get distracted. So I appreciated the having a place to go every day, having a, a syllabus to follow through. But other people, autodidacts and people who can learn on their own, can put together amazing curriculum on their own and make it happen. But then they have trouble proving that to, uh, to, a, to a recruiter or to someone who is a gatekeeper that's preventing them from getting an interview. So the acknowledgement that it's, it's different for everybody, I think, is really important. Exactly. And this would be a cool time to mention that I was mostly homeschooled kind of in my um, secondary school or uh, what you would, uh, what is also called high school. Mm -hmm. And that I think also had a big impact on my ability to learn outside of the traditional school system. Did you learn that on your own or did you have, you know, supportive parents that taught you how to learn? Because we really, you're thrown into it, uh, into the deep end of the pool by yourself there. If you're in high school at home for years and you have to figure out how to learn on your own. I think my mom especially set me up with the core knowledge of how to learn on your own. Mm -hmm. And then I did have um, some support from my older siblings. But then I would say that learning how to learn on my own was a, is a great skill that I picked up from uh, having to school at home. And mm -hmm. that was what kind of helped me get into this field without that prior degree that other people have. How did you know that it was appropriate and correct and good for you to have a website that has YouTube videos and mentorship calls and you are able to be a visible, present designer on the internet? I mean, not every designer or coder is is doing that. Some are just quietly doing their jobs, but they're not choosing to put in any kind of external uh, links to prove their existence. But you seem to have done that naturally. Did you figure that out on your own or did you do that because someone said you need to maintain your personal brand? Honestly, the concept of having a personal brand didn't really come to me or I didn't really hear about that until very recently. I wasn't sure what that meant for me. Everything that I have online is mostly for me just feeling like I have a very unique story and, and, and pathway into my current profession. And I just really, really, really want to make sure that the information that I found is also available to other people. And I've been doing this through different ways. When I uh, first started, I started out with like medium articles, um, sharing like, you know, resources that I thought were cool, all sorts of things like that. And then from there, I think I created a newsletter. I sent out a couple <laughs> emails to people, you know, that would subscribe, talking them through different things that I had learned. And it was a gradual process until I picked up the confidence to start recording. And then I started, got my phone, I started using that, and then I eventually got a camera. And so it's just been a gradual process. And right now, I'm also in the book writing phase, which is new for me. And so I also have written a book that's launching pretty soon, actually um, on the 31st of January. Mm -hmm. And it's about, you know, how to get your first job as a, as, as a user experience designer. And so for me, it all just comes from a passion of learning, of uh, teaching people rather, of spreading knowledge. Um, I would say I'm very interested in what I would call decentralized education, you know, 
how can we take education from like just being, you know, in these rigid spots to like being something that everybody can, you know, share exchange and, you know, how can we ease up that process? Interesting. That seems like it's very much a philosophy of inclusion. And I use that term as the exact opposite of exclusion, because when we say at the beginning of the conversation here that, you know, maybe school's not for everyone, then we're going to be excluding people for whom it's not for. How can we include them and cast a wide net so that more people can get involved in the, uh, you know, in the job that you're interested in, you know, make design portfolios, do their own projects and not necessarily be stopped because, you, you got to get a master's degree in design if you're going to be successful in this in this business. Exactly. Yeah. I'll make sure to put a link to your book. This is the UX Design Self-Study Resources that you're putting out, or is this a new book? Oh, it's a new book. I will send you the link for that one. It's uh, Landing Your First uh, Design Job. Landing Your First Design Job. Fantastic. So by the time folks hear this podcast, which we're recording at the end of January, that book will be available and we'll have a link in the show notes. So you'd be sure to check that out. You, you're putting all of this information out, though, uh, very generously. You've got a great YouTube channel with lots and lots of tips. It's all about tips, whether it be side hustle tips, creating a UX portfolio. Are these the tips that you've collected in your journey and you just want to make sure that the other people out there can find them as well? Yes, there are things that I have learned also the hard way, things that I wish I knew. I think it's really a lot of things that I wish I, I had known earlier mm. that now I'm like, if I had known this a couple years ago, I would have moved ahead like so fast. So now I'm like, I'm going to let this put this online. Hopefully people find it and people who are younger in their careers don't have to, you know, go through the things that I did and the stress <laughs> and just come across this information as easily as possible. That's very much in line with my philosophy. Like just because I suffer doesn't mean that you should have to suffer. And you're, you're putting all that information in kind of one place so they don't have to find it themselves so difficultly. Yeah, precisely. And yeah. this year, especially I've like really written out a plan. I have so much content that I'm creating um, for people and it's all just going to be on my, on my YouTube channel. What do you tell people though, who, uh, who will say you're giving away too much for free and then you start blurring the line between your main job, which, you know, your, your full-time job as a designer, and then these side hustles, which, you know, my side hustle, my blog, it's not something that I could live on. You know, the podcast is a fun thing to do, but I'm not going to quit my job and pay the rent with, uh, with the podcast, but we do it anyway. Are you just a, are you a professional enthusiast? I think I'm mostly going with the flow, you know, I'll see where it goes. For now, I'm still very much interested in creating products and in solving design problems. So that's where my, most of my focus is. And of course, there you know are people that you know say to me, "Oh, you should sell this," or when I sell something, they say, "You should sell it for more, for even more." But the truth is, the people that I end up talking to a lot are actually usually from marginalized communities. And those are the people, because I also have one-on-one -on -one mentorship sessions, and those are the people that I end up talking to uh, the most. So um, usually people of color and people from, you know, just very unique backgrounds. And so it's very important to me also that I keep whatever it is that I'm putting out there affordable for people, because I have a full-time job that is able to take care of me, so I don't necessarily need... Um, all of this. It helps me, it supports me, it keeps me going. Mm -hmm. But I'm just more concerned about getting information out there to people that need it. That's a really interesting balance. I find myself in a similar situation that I've got 20 plus years of content out there on the YouTube, on the podcast, on the blog. And I'll have people say, oh, I, you know, they'll email you. You probably had this. I can monetize that for you. I'll put it behind a subscription wall and then they can have the the Hanselman subscription or the Sharon subscription. And then people, and the next thing you know, how many people have you cut off from that material? But at the same time, you don't want to do it entirely for free. So the balance of making sure that it is available to everyone, especially in underrepresented groups that, you know, uh, the barrier to entry, you don't want it to be $89 a month for a subscription to Sharon's design details. That's not enough. That's not going to be possible. But um, the, the, the same groups, though, want to see you win and want to see you succeed and want to see you get paid. Exactly. Yeah. 
Yeah, that is challenging. I, I like that we do have our full-time jobs that allow us to do these hobbies. I think that putting good information out into the world for free or a reasonable price is a pretty darn good hobby. And uh, the acknowledgement that a side hustle doesn't necessarily need to pay the rent, but can just give you a little bit, bit of walking around money is also nice. Yeah, absolutely. That is precisely my mindset also. Mm -hmm. But you still do one-on-one -on -one design mentorship sessions and you've actually you know, put that in your blog. It's, on your, it's advertised prominently on your website. How do you find that balance between scaling yourself which doesn't scale if you only do one-on-ones and, and broad outreach like YouTube and like books. Broad outreach is, is hard. And I've actually really been thinking of a way that I can actually get to talk to a larger audience of people, but, you know, not, but on a more personal level, you know, so YouTube is very impersonal. Like it's for everybody and anyone, but like I've been thinking of, you know, how can I create a community? How can I get people together? And that's still, in the works and it's still something that I'm uh, trying to craft. But in the meantime, I have uh, these one-on-one -on -one sessions and I'm soon gonna start doing like live streams and stuff like that. Um, so I have plans, but for now the one-on-one -on -one sessions are kind of doing, um, doing enough. And then with time I will go a bit further and see how I can scale also. That's cool. At the end of the day, your customer has to be at the center of everything you do. This starts with the right customer data strategy, as well as the right foundation to solve the challenges that typically inhibit the success of your company, such as data quality, data governance, and connectivity. MParticle is your real-time customer data infrastructure that helps you accelerate your data strategy by cleansing, visualizing, and integrating your customer data from anywhere to anywhere. Ultimately, better data leads to better decisions, better customer experiences, and better outcomes. See why the best brands choose MParticle. Go to mparticle.com. That's M-P-A-R-T-I-C-L-E.com. Let's pivot a little bit, and I want to understand how you transitioned and how one should transition from, you know, let's say like, you know, doing pamphlets, doing PDFs, doing print design and into more formal application design. You said that you were interested in not just the foundations of UX design, but starting to get into how those things work in websites and in apps. Was that a natural jump from kind of, I think of print, which I guess now means PDFs and static things into a more interactive model? Yeah. Uh, so for me, it was, it was quite a transition because I went from that to front end development than to UX. Mm. So I think one of the first things that I would say is if you're moving purely from this print kind of advertising marketing type of design into user experience design, the first thing you really need to understand is the web. How does the web work? How does the internet work? What is the internet? You know, like just kind of those basics to really understand what the world of uh, technology means, not just from the standpoint of a user, but now from the standpoint of a creator, of someone who's going to be creating for the web. What are the things you need to, need to know to be able to create for the web? You know, concepts around accessibility, concepts around um, the different platforms, different devices, and how all of that translates to design will give you also a really good um, foundation just knowing, you know, the components that you typically would see on a website or on a web on a web application or a mobile application gives you a really solid background. And so I got that knowledge from dabbling into front end development. But if you're not familiar with that, then there's, of course, resources online to familiarize yourself with um, you know, the Internet and how all of that works. Yeah, you really have to have that initial fascination. Uh, I got interested in UX design at a deeper level when I started to notice the difference between Windows and Mac and then, you know, Android and iOS. And I would be in an application and I would, you know, have an interaction. I would click on something or I'd pull a list down and I'd go, wow, I've never seen a list like that before. I wonder what that control is called. I wonder what that thing I just used is because there's life beyond just drop down lists and radio buttons and things like that. And then you can really yeah. start learning about all new creative ways to do things and then argue about them, like the ubiquitous hamburger menu, right? You know, that three lines menu. And like, is that a good yeah. thing or not? There's whole, whole talks could be done on whether or not hamburger menus are a good idea. Yeah. 
And, you know, to, to add to your point, also design is such, it's, it's also such a dynamic, such a growing field. Mm -hmm. And also it, it relies heavily on, on people, users and people change, people change so fast, you know? And so there's a lot of trends to keep up with. There's a lot of knowledge to, you know, to continue listening out for because, you know, things are constantly evolving, you know? And so I think that's also something to have in mind when you're trying to, uh, to transition because like everything, but especially with design, what you knew two years ago will still be valid, but it would, would really have changed quite a bit, you know, in today's world. That is so true. And that gets back to that, that point we made about how you really have to um, learn how to learn. Because if you yeah. go in with a fixed mindset and not a growth mindset, you're very, very quickly going to learn that what you learned in school or what you learned in that certificate a month ago, it's changed. And there's an all new way to do that or all new thinking in UX that's just appeared. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing how tools have changed so quickly. Uh, I think four or five years ago, I didn't know that Figma was a thing. And now it's like all I see in design circles. And then you ask yourself, how did we survive before it? How did we do this kind of work before this tool existed or that tool existed? Exactly. And the growth of Figma has been astronomical. It's, it's, it's mind blowing. It's such a fascinating thing. And I think what really set, there were two things that set uh, Figma apart. Like I totally geek out about, about, you know, talking about Figma because I've been such a fan for the longest time. The first thing that set Figma apart was simplifying collaboration, like, and not just collaboration with other people, collaboration with yourself and with your own tools. That if you log into Figma, like on your laptop at home and you log into Figma on your laptop at work, it's going to be so easy. Like there's nothing, that, there's no transferring of files. There's no putting the file on a flash drive and taking it. And then if you forgot it, like you can't work, you know? So that ease. And another thing was really making it so inclusive. So there was no um, barriers like, oh, this platform can, like it's only meant for this platform. It's only meant for Mac or it's only meant for Windows. It was accessible. If you have a browser, you can use Figma. If you have Google Chrome. So those two things just completely set them apart from what anyone else was doing. Yeah, Figma is a, a great example of a web application that is impossible. Like it should not be possible to have an infinite canvas, a smart clipboard manager, and the ability to move things around so quickly it's, it's faster than it should be possible. Uh, it really is an example of if someone says, I don't think that's possible in, 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 in the web, you just show them Figma and you say, well, they figured it out. So <laughs> whatever it is we want to do is probably going to be pretty, uh, pretty possible. Yeah, absolutely. They're, they are trendsetters and I have so much respect for them. Yeah, absolutely. So if someone's going to put together a portfolio and they're going to start designing uh, their own things and then presenting themselves out to the world, should they start at Figma or should they start at Photoshop? Because I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples. I work with a, a diversity of designers and some might be, I am a designer who works in Illustrator and I do things in vectors and I think about things in vectors and I can't not be an illustrator. And then I'll meet someone else who is born and bred in Photoshop. And if it's a, if it's not a PSD, then I'm not interested in talking to you. And then I have the, the more CSS people who think and work in markup. So there isn't an original design. There is only what I can do in, in text. Are they all the same kind of designer? And what would you tell for a beginner? Which path to pick? For a beginner in today's world, Absolutely. Just start with Figma. Figma has gotten to this point where you can do a little bit of everything in it, you know, and they also recently launched a fig jam, which also helps you do like a whiteboard thing and, you know, basically anything that you really want to do from a design perspective. Aside, you know, um, some more specific features, you know, for example, like uh, photo manipulation, which of course you're always going to find your way back to to Photoshop and everything. But this is now a tool that's like really optimized um, for uh, for the web. And Adobe does also have its own um, tool that is you know geared towards user experience design, which is Adobe XD. Um, but I find that 
Um, while that's a really, really cool tool, Figma is currently kind of really dominating the market. And so it can be helpful to, you know, align yourself with, you know, with the tool that is more popular with like potential employers and clients and stuff like that. That's actually really good advice. I mean, if it's a ubiquitous tool, then it's the one that we should probably think about. So I'm hearing you say that understand the fundamentals of the web, CSS, HTML, et cetera, maybe a little JavaScript for interactivity, and then Figma. And if you know how to use those tools, that is that more important than having Creative Cloud on your on your LinkedIn or your resume? I think to a large extent, yeah. And when I even say, um, you know, understanding the web, because I get the question a lot about, you know, should designers like UX designers know how to code? You know, that's like another another really common question. That was actually my next question. <laughs> so, well, we can just answer it now. You don't necessarily need to know how to code. Mm. Will it help you? Yes. But you don't necessarily need to. But I do encourage everyone to have a basic understanding of at least HTML. You know, your divs, your even your heading classes, you know, all sorts of things like that. Those building, those blocks that are in literally every, you know, website, you need to have an understanding of those things. So just, and it takes, HTML is so easy to learn. You know, you can just take a day and dabble into it and another day and dabble into CSS. It really reframes how you think about websites. And in addition to that, when you eventually start, you know, if you, if you haven't worked full time before, you know, with developers and everything, it really eases the conversations that you can have with them because you can talk to them about certain concepts and you feel like you can explain to them and they can also talk to you because you're not speaking completely different languages. You know, you can relate to some concepts a bit better. That is huge. I love that you brought that up. And I want to make sure that we hit that really hard because I think it's important to understand that there are, there's a Venn diagram, right? There's circles that get close to each other and they're touching when you think about a UX designer and a coder and a front end developer and another front end developer, right? So yeah. if you can say, yeah, in the on focus event or the on blur event, or, you know, when the accessibility modifier fires and you can speak that flavor of language, that dialect to the developer, uh, you're going to be much better off. If you can suggest, no, we can do this in CSS. We don't even need JavaScript for that interactive moment then you're going you're gonna to be more successful. But in order to do that, as I've said before, uh, this metaphor, you have to learn how to drive stick shift. You can't just ride in an Uber. You have to understand a little bit about how the car works. I think yeah. sometimes, though, people get, uh, particularly early in career, people don't know when to stop learning. So here's a question for the UX designer who knows a little CSS and a little JavaScript. How deep do you go? Because you could get analysis paralysis if you try to learn everything. When do you stop yeah. learning uh, about front-end design and say, I'm going to be a UX designer, but I'm not going to be a professional JavaScript front-end developer? I think once you have the basics, ideally you can you can stop, but the people who are really having the most fun are the people who enjoy it. So you see those people that are building this nifty things for no particular reason, just putting <laughs> out some fancy JavaScript thing. Yeah, that the code animates. pen people, they're just having yes. so much fun. Exactly. The code pen people, you know, I saw some really cool animations done in, you know, in, in JavaScript and CSS. And I was like, okay, you know, those <laughs> are the people that are having the most fun out here. And, you know, it's, it's something that I personally just, you know, love to see. So if you get to a point where you're enjoying it, by all means, continue, have fun with it. But Otherwise, feel free to just stop at some, you know, very basic concepts. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't need to go too far. I mean, beyond, you know, basic, just being able to build, you know, a very simple, basic website that can mm -hmm. do some very simple things. That's fine. Yeah. But if you find something, uh, if you're pulling on a thread on your sweater and you find it fascinating, keep pulling because you don't know what you're going to find. There's going to be cool stuff under there. Have you ever heard the term nerd sniping? Nerd sniping. No, what does that mean? So nerd sniping is when you give a person of a certain personality, could be a mathematician, could be a UX designer, and you give them a problem. And as soon as you've sniped them, you've hit them with this problem, they stop functioning because they can't live until they've solved it. So I've seen personalities that succeed in tech, whether they be coders or designers, say, 
I bet you couldn't make an entire iPhone interface with CSS. And then you go, oh, um, and then you start to pair, you know, you're frozen and you're like, I'm going to go into CodePen right now and see if that's possible. And then you can't stop until, so then you've been nerd sniped with a problem. <laughs> you tell an engineer it's not possible and then they will prove that it is in fact possible. Do you think that's a good personality uh, trait for a designer? No, no when to give up. Pick your battles. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so no when to give up. Sometimes yeah. I'll just abandon my whole family and stay up all night to solve a problem. So I sh sh probably shouldn't do that is what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably not. Just, you know, go get some rest, sleep. <laughs> it's okay. You're you know, going to be or a just quit. <laughs> you're far more balanced uh, designer and developer than I ever will be because <laughs> that has been my getting nerd sniped has been a huge problem and, and it makes it hard to concentrate on anything else until you crack that crack that thing, that problem. Yeah, absolutely. I probably have encountered that, like, because, you know, when it comes to design, it's it can be a bit of an ambiguous field, you know? There isn't this set answer, like, this is how you solve this a lot of the time. You know, it's about trying out different things and just seeing which one makes the most sense. And so there have been some times when it was like, I have to find what makes the most sense for this. And you just keep going and going. And that moment where you actually find a solution that makes sense, it's such a euphoric feeling, you know? So absolutely, I, I can I can relate, but I do not advise it. Just <laughs> give up sometimes, you know? It's, it's, it's okay. To go and rest, sleep. But that euphoric feeling that you have felt and I have felt, that's what we want our friends, our listeners, and the folks that we're getting involved early in tech to feel like. We want them to have that feeling. And that's why we're so passionate about sharing the information. And I can tell it from your enthusiasm, from your YouTube channel, that you want people to win so that they will feel that feeling as well. So I really appreciate you chatting with me today. Thank you so much. This was a really lovely conversation. We've been chatting with product designer and educator Sharon Onyenye. You can take a look at her website at SharonOnyenye.com. I'll put a link in the show notes, and you can also check her out on YouTube and Twitter. This has been another episode of Hansel Minutes, and we'll see you again next week. <laughs>